Hey everyone, welcome back to Kinetics. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the rate constant and specifically we're going to be talking about the temperature dependence of the rate constant and how it's modeled out by the Arrhenius equation. So remember, um, your rate law tells you that the rate is equal to K times the concentration of A to some power M where M is the order of A times the concentration of B to some power N where N is the order of N. And K is your rate constant. Now, it's called rate constant, but it's not always a constant value. Your rate constant is actually dependent on uh, temperature. And the dependence is mapped out by the Arrhenius equation. So it tells you that your rate constant is a e, uh, e to the minus uh, Ea over Rt. So what do all of these mean? Let's start with Ea. That Ea represents your activation energy. And um, the activation energy is going to be the energy uh, difference between your reactants and your transition state, A. Um, and so whenever you look at any reaction, its reaction energy diagram is going to look something like uh, the ones that uh, are here. So you always have your reactants in your products, and depending on whether or not your reaction is endothermic or exothermic, your products may be above or below your reactants. But between your reactants and your products, you always have some uh, area where you have the highest potential energy. And that is known as your transition state. There's a required amount of energy to go from the reactants to the transition state. Um, and so if molecules have enough energy to overcome that barrier, they can become products. So that is your EA. It's the minimum amount of energy that uh, particles need in order to form products. Um, and so your Ea in your exothermic reaction would be here. That's your activation energy. The A, the A is known as your pre-exponential factor. And the A represents the frequency of collisions. Um, it's also known as the frequency factor. So as the frequency of collisions go up, your A goes up, which means your rate constant goes up. The next bit, uh, R, R is your gas constant. It's 8.3145 joules per mole times Kelvin. And then your T is your uh, temperature in Kelvin. It's absolute temperature. Um, if you use Celsius, it's not going to work. You have to use Kelvin. And remember, to turn Celsius to Kelvin, you just add 273. The Arrhenius equation has uh, two different forms. And we're going to derive, uh, we're going to do like a, like, a, like a bootleg version of the derivation at the end of the Arrhenius equation and all of its forms. But you have two different forms. Um, you have the two-point form, which tells you that um, oh, whoops, this is the wrong one. Uh, the two-point form tells you that the natural log of K2 over K1 is equal to Ea over R times 1 over temperature 1 minus 1 over temperature 2. Um, sorry, this is the wrong equation. Um, that's your two-point form. The two-point form helps relate two different, uh, two, the, the same reaction happening at two different temperatures. So at two different temperatures, you're going to have two different rate constants and the relationship between them is modeled out by the two-point form. The graphical form is the more common version of the uh, form, and it tells you that the natural log of K is equal to minus Ea over R times 1 over T plus the natural log of A. And if you notice, this equation is in the form of Y equals MX plus B. Um, and so your slope is your minus Ea over R, your X is 1 over T, your Y is natural log of K, and your B is the natural log of A. And you can see all of that in this uh, graph here. Um, the, the graphical form, this slope here, uh, is just negative Ea over R. And so that's your graphical form. Um, again, we'll derive all of this later on. But for now, these are two different forms of the Arrhenius equation that you might also see. Um, let's do an example. The, uh, a rule of thumb is that a reaction's rate roughly doubles for every 10, uh, 10 degrees Celsius increase in temperature. What is the activation energy of a reaction whose rate exactly doubles between 25 degrees Celsius and 35 degrees Celsius? Okay, so we have two different temperatures. Um, temperature 1, let's let temperature 1 be 25 degrees Celsius. Uh, 25 degrees Celsius is 298 Kelvin. And then you have your second temperature. T2, which is 35 degrees Celsius, so that's 308 Kelvin. And since we're comparing um, the, uh, the temperatures and the uh, 
ray constants and also the activation energy, this is a clear sign that we're going to be using the two-point form. So the two-point form tells you that the natural log of K2 over K1 is equal to Ea over R times 1 over T1 minus 1 over T2. And um, you know your T1, you know your T2, you know R because R is a constant. All you have to find out is the um, is K2 over K1. Now, we know K2 over K1. We're told that the reactions rate, that a reactions rate roughly doubles, doubles for every 10 degrees uh, Celsius increase. So the relationship between K2 over K1 has to be two. So K2 over K1 has to be two. That's because whatever value K1 is, K2 has to be double that since the reaction speed is double um, in a 10 degrees Celsius increase. So we can uh, plug everything in. We know that the natural log of two is equal to Ea over R. Uh, R is 8.3145 joules per mole times Kelvin, uh, times one over temperature one. Uh, temperature one is 298 um, Kelvin, and then minus one over temperature two, which is 308 Kelvin. All right, uh, all that's left is to simplify Ea um, and EA comes out to uh, 52,897 uh, joules per mole, um, and that's right about 52.9 kilojoules uh, per mole. And that is answer choice A. So that is the activation energy of this reaction. Um, and this uh, goes to show you, uh, I guess, scenarios where your two-point form is kind of helpful. All right. The next thing I want to talk about is the fact that the rate constant has different units based on your reaction order. So remember your rate law tells you that the rate is equal to K times the concentration of A to some power M times the concentration of B to some power N. The rate always needs to be in the units of uh, molarity per second. But the problem is that your A is in the, is in the units of uh, molarity and you always have some power m and n. m and n is always going to be different, so you need some way to balance uh, out the units in order to get molarity per second. So that k is there uh, in order to balance everything out. So let's say um, m and n were one and one. So your rate is equal to k times the concentration of A times the concentration of B. This here has the uh, units of molarity squared. We want some sort of unit here, where if we multiply the unit by, uh, if we multiply molarity squared by this unit, you're gonna get molarity per second. And your x, the units for x needs to come out to one over molarity per second. And you can see that um, that is what the unit for k is, given a reaction order of two. And you can do the same process for all your different reaction orders, and you'll get the same pattern um, that you see here on this table. All right, now that we have that out of the way, I want to talk about the derivation of the rate constant. So imagine you have a reaction where A and B are reacting to form C and D. From your collision theory of uh, gases, the rate is equal to the collision frequency, uh, so how fast they collide, and it's also multiplied by the percentage of those reactions with the right amount of energy. So remember your activation energy. Not all collisions are gonna have enough energy to get past that barrier. Um, one thing about this derivation is that it's really hand wavy. So um, this rate this rate thing, this, uh, it, this is coming from your collision theory. Uh, collision, I-O-N theory. Um, and the other stuff that we'll, we'll uh, use in order to get the final derivation is also gonna be based on other models that uh, we haven't really covered or we're not going to cover in great detail here. All right, so your collision frequency is your is sigma times your mean relative velocity times Avogadro's constant squared times the concentration of A and B. This comes from the kinetic model of a gas. And let's talk about what all of these symbols mean. Sigma represents uh, how much like how much of a molecule is present during a collision. So you can imagine within a big molecule, a big molecule has a lot of surface area in order to collide. If you compare that to a small molecule, it doesn't have as much surface area for collisions to happen. 
So the amount of a molecule that's present uh, or available to collide is going to affect your collision frequency. The other parts, the mean uh, relative velocity, that's that uh, V there, um, all the gases are moving at different speeds, but if you were to average all the speeds, it's not really an average, there's like a function for uh, your mean relative velocity, but you can think of it as the average velocity of the gases. Na squared, that's, your, that's Avogadro's constant squared, so that's just a number, um, and then your concentrations of A and B. The other part, the percentage with enough energy, is going to come from your Boltzmann distribution. And your Boltzmann distribution tells you that the percentage of uh, collisions with the right amount of energy is going to be E to the minus EA, your activation energy, over RT. So if we put all of this together, the rate is the sigma times the mean relative velocity times Avogadro's constant squared over uh, times the concentration of A and B times EA, E to the minus EA over RT. That's kind of a, a, a mouthful, I guess. Um, and so from here, you know that your rate is also going to be equal to K times the concentration of A and B. This is coming from your rate law. Um, so if we were to isolate K, because remember, we're trying to get K out of all of this. So what we really care about is K. Your K is just your rate over the concentrations of A and B. And from here, it, uh, you should be able to see like what we're about to do. So we have K and we have our rate. If you just plug them in, um, what happens is that you can end up canceling out the A's, the concentrations of the A's and the B's, and you're left with this final form. Um, and this final form can be simplified even further by taking this entire first value here that we have, um, that sigma mean relative velocity times Avogadro's constant squared, and we just say that's A. Um, that's a constant. And so that's your final expression here. Your K is equal to a e to the minus e a over r t. The things about your e a and your a is that they're known as Arrhenius prefactors. Arrhenius prefactors. I don't know if I spelled that right. I'll be honest. Um, they're known as your Arrhenius prefactors because they don't. Uh, the the temperature doesn't really change their values. Uh, you can imagine your activation energy is not going to change depending on your, on your temperature. Your activation energy is a property of the reaction itself. Now the thing about the first part, the sigma mean relative velocity times uh, Avogadro's constant squared, is that you have that velocity there. And remember, if you uh, increase the temperature of anything, the molecules are going to start moving faster and faster. So the Arrhenius, um, the pre-exponential factor, your A, is actually a little dependent on temperature. But the thing is that your uh, mean relative velocity doesn't really affect temperature uh, to a great extent. Um, in fact, it barely changes it. Most of your temperature dependence is going to come from that temperature in your E to the minus EA over RT, from your Boltzmann distribution. Um, so that's why your A and your EA are known as Arrhenius prefactors, even though A is technically a little temperature based, um, but uh, this is just a model. Um, and the temperature dependence of that little bit there isn't great, uh, so we kind of neglect it. Okay, now that we have this form, uh, we can get our, our graphical form by just taking the natural log of both sides, and you get that the natural log of K is equal to the natural log of A minus EA over RT. That is your graphical form, that's your Y equals MX plus B, um, and we can take this and we can split it up. In order to get our two-point form, imagine you have two, you have the same reaction happening at two different temperatures. So at temperature one, your temperature is T1, and at temperature two, your temperature is T2. Your rate constants are K1 and K2, and remember, uh, and remember they are different because your rate constant is of course dependent on temperature. So if you were to plug these into our graphical form, you get uh, these two equations here and you can uh, combine them by subtracting them. So the natural log of K1 minus the natural log of K2 is minus EA over RT1 plus EA over RT2. And you can simplify that even further to the natural log of K1 over the natural log of K2 is EA, uh, EA over R times one over T2 minus, minus one over uh, T1. That's your two point form. That is the exact same thing as the natural log of K2 over K1 uh, equals to EA over R 
times 1 over t1 minus 1 over t2. These are the exact same thing. Um, you can change around the orders, but remember you have to keep the relative orders the same. So if you put t1 on the top, uh, then temperature 2, or if you put k2 at the top, temperature 2 has to go to the right and uh, vice versa. And that's your two-point form. That's your derivation of your Arrhenius equation and the two different forms of it. Um, and I hope this gave you a good understanding of why the rate constant is dependent on temperature and how the equation for the rate constant um, actually makes sense, why we use the Arrhenius equation. Of course, the Arrhenius equation is just a model. It's not really perfect. In fact, for some reactions, it messes up quite a lot. But for how simple of a model this is, it works really, really well. Um, and that's why, we, that's why we use the Arrhenius equation to show the temperature dependence of the rate constant. Um, and so that's all I have. I hope this was helpful. Um, I hope to see you later. Uh, thank you for watching.